What if we could beat the obesity epidemic? It's a problem that's gotten bigger and bigger for decades in America. Now, a new set of drugs is providing hope by allowing Americans to lower the impulses at the heart of the problem for many people. And that's just the start of the potential impact from these revolutionary treatments known as GLP-1 drugs. Hi, welcome to Insights to Activate, Ipsos is series focusing on some of the biggest topics facing the world today. I'm Ben Meyerson, Director of Marketing and Communications here at Ipsos, and I'll be your host as we talk about GLP-1 drugs and how they have potential to reshape society. We have a fantastic group of experts here from Ipsos who will tell you all about how we got here, where we're going, and what your business needs to do to be prepared and take advantage. But first, let me set the stage and explain just why it's important for businesses across sectors to understand what's happening here. Let's start with this. What is a GLP-1 drug? If you're not a patient, you might not have heard the term, but you may have heard of Ozempic. That's actually the name of one GLP-1 drug that was approved for treating diabetes, but became famous as it was used by celebrities for weight loss. That's because the same things that cause it to be useful for managing blood sugar in diabetics also make it useful for managing cravings that can cause weight gain. They're already immensely popular. Ipsos polling shows that already, as of earlier this year, 10% of people surveyed by Ipsos were taking a GLP-1 drug, and more than half of the U.S. population is interested in taking a drug that would help reduce the craving to eat. So what does that mean for businesses beyond just the pharma companies making and selling these drugs? Food and beverage companies and restaurants may face lower sales unless they pivot to provide products catering to people taking GLP-1 drugs. Clothing retailers may see more sales from people updating their wardrobes Cosmetics brands are already positioning their products to help people deal with skin changes that come with rapid weight loss. And there are even possible effects for airlines. Some are already forecasting fuel savings from passengers who weigh less on average. And that's just the start of the way GLP-1 drugs could reshape society. What does your company need to know about these drugs? And how could they reshape your business? Let's meet our panel and get into it. Hi, Ben. I'm happy to be here today. I'm Allison. I work in Ipsos's innovation team, and my focus is helping our clients bring new innovation to market. Hey, yeah. Hi, Ben. Hi, everyone. I'm Philip Ryan. I'm managing partner of Ipsos Strategy 3, which is our growth consultancy within Ipsos. And we focus a lot on what are the broader trends happening in society and how will they reshape how we consume and, and offer products and services. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackie Alacqua. I run our global healthcare syndicated business, and we're running lots of studies around GLP-1s. Very interesting topic and looking forward to talking about it today. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Jackie, let's start with you as our healthcare expert. Uh, GLP-1 drugs aren't new. Even though Zepic's been around since like 2017, how did we get here? It's a good question. Thanks, Ben. Um, so you're right. Um, Ozempic's been around since 2017. It was initially used for type 2 diabetes. People think about it now as an obesity drug, but in fact, Ozempic is still a type 2 diabetes drug, um, and it's been rebranded with different dosing for obesity uh, as Wagovi. Uh, there are two drugs on the market right now so uh, for obesity. So there is Wagovi and there is Zepbound. Uh, and as you said earlier, over 10% of the population have already tried these drugs. Um, but I think what's really important to, to note is that it's not the first time that a drug has been used in one indication and then found to be beneficial in another. What most people probably are familiar with is Viagra. So most people think about Viagra for erectile dysfunction, but the reality is that Viagra was originally used for cardiovascular disease. So this happens, you know, quite frequently. Um, I think I just want to move on beyond obesity a little bit, because right now we're talking about two drugs that are on the market to treat obesity. There's a hundred, almost a hundred additional drugs in the pipeline being, being developed. They won't all get approved. But it's not just about obesity, um, because these drugs are being studied in a lot of different indications, right? So they're being looked at for sleep apnea. They're being looked at for addiction, right? You were talking about cutting down the cravings. So they're being looked at for addiction, for sleep apnea, for cardiovascular. Uh, they're finding benefits in Alzheimer's disease. So when we talk about 10% of the population right now that are using these drugs for weight loss, you can imagine a world where so many more people are going to be using them for all different diseases. And so I really think that this is the biggest breakthrough that we've seen in healthcare in so many years. And in fact, it's a revolution in healthcare. It's really going to be exciting to see what happens in the future. 
Philip, I'm gonna to kick to you now. So you work with clients across so many different spaces. Um, what kind of clients are you talking to and what kind of questions are you getting from them and in how many different sectors? Yeah, um, absolutely, we're getting, so questions are coming from across a variety of sectors as you can imagine. And it's interesting, a lot of them are, GLP ones are featuring in the questions, but some of them usually as part of some of the broader, the other shifts we see in society. Um, and there's two type, big questions that I, I, I think we're, we're looking at here. One is, what are the direct impacts of GLP ones, of the Ozempics, Wegovies, etc., on what I either consume, what I put in my body, what I put on my body, or how I interact with the world? So that's one type of question. Um, the other one is a bigger question, which is, what are the other shifts that might happen? The, these are questions I don't think enough people are asking. But if I start with the first ones, the types of things we're, we're getting asked are similar to what you talked about before. If you think about um, what I put in my body, we think about, are we going to have a situation where there's some brands who are saying, okay, let's take candy, for example. If there's going to be fewer cravings for candy products and sweets and chocolates, do I go for more of a quality over quantity type of approach that changes my formulation? What I do, is it going to be more of a actually a treat versus an everyday occurrence, right? Um, if I think about what I put on my body, you mentioned skincare, but we can also look at clothing, right? And you have true fit sizing that brands are starting to look at in terms of how do I adjust when I've got my actual consumer target for my products is adjusting as well. And then if you think about what's going on around me, uh, you can look at, you mentioned the airline example, right? And I think that financial analyst uh, had calculated that if every single United passenger lost, I think, 10 pounds, uh, they would save about 80 million a year in fuel costs, right? So those are some of the types of questions we're getting. Um, but the bigger ones I think that are not being asked are actually the, big, the more important questions. Like what else shifts as a result in our culture, in our society, as a result of some of these drugs? And, and the best example I can think of is if you go back to Prozac, right? So Prozac is, is launched, helps treat uh, depression, but it also opened up an entirely new conversation around mental health and how we talk about that. And you see that everywhere to today in society and how we talk about that um, with one another. And it's been normalized, right? So what changes in the world when we start to think about, you know, is being slim and thin no longer a status symbol, for example, right? Um, is, um, is obesity not seen as a choice, but seen as actually what it truly is, which is it is a healthcare condition that, you know, people, people struggle with, right? So all of these change. So Sorry. exactly what I was going to point out is exactly what you were saying about what Prozac did for mental health is what these drugs are doing for obesity. So instead of it being a stigma or people should just eat a little bit less, it's being recognized as the disease that it is with prescription treatments available to treat it. And I think, you know, that is a real positive benefit, um, you know, in, in the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think those are the things that people aren't thinking about enough. Like, what are the ripple effects yeah. of this? It's not just about weight loss. It's much broader than that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really what we get to when we talk about, I mean, the, the name of our report here is reshaping society. Really, not just the, the immediate knock-on effects of people losing weight. Just that pretty much every company, almost every industry needs to consider the effects here. So are you finding that a lot of companies are thinking in that mindset or that you're having to talk to, cl to clients and say, hey, this is a pretty big signal here. You need to prepare for it. And you're the one starting that conversation. You know, I think we're getting a few direct questions um, related to this, but not, I don't think enough, right? So I don't think enough companies are truly thinking about it in the way that this could have a huge effect on society and how it gets shaped. Um, it is being asked as part of some of the things when we get asked about what are the other factors that are going on in society. So we'll often look at thing, the macro forces going on, what's going on in society, in healthcare, in technology, in government and regulation. And it features as part of that conversation, as part of the broader set of shifts that are happening. But probably it's not being thought about or given enough attention as it could be. Yeah. Alison, you uh, deal with innovation, obviously, and so much of that is innovating new products. <laughs> What kind of products are you seeing as you go here? Is this really the kind of uh, revolution that companies need to be seeing it as? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a great question. We are having lots of really fascinating conversations with our clients as it pertains to innovation in this space. Um, and a lot of those things are really centered around a couple of key areas. 
I mean, first and foremost, Philip mentioned this a little bit when he was talking, but what are those true needs for consumers from a product level and also a service level? What What is it that they need to be that um, part of their journey as they're on these particular medications? Also, like changes in purchasing habits, right? You know, eating less, portion control, those are very important topics. And how is that impacting people's decisions at, at point of purchase? But what's really fascinating is when we talk at a sector level. So food and beverage is obviously that kind of immediate space that everyone is reacting. Um, we're having lots of conversations with our clients around assortment, sizing, what's the right size mix that we need to have in our portfolio. We're even talking a lot about nutritional content. So protein and things like fiber for digestive health. And we're seeing products already hitting the marketplace in this space and Nestle's launched a line of frozen meals called Vital Pursuit, higher in protein. And we're even seeing those direct to consumer brands coming out with, with new products as well. Daily Harvest is one to mention. They have their GLP-1 food companion, which is a lower saturated fat product, um, high in fiber to help aid in digestion. Um, but beyond food and beverage, we're also having lots of really good conversations with fitness and diet brands around how do we adjust you know, those workouts? How do we adjust our um, diet plans for our consumers? Uh, Noom is doing a great job at already adapting this, and they've even forged some partnerships uh, with other companies to get there. Um, beyond uh, fitness, we're also talking a lot to supplement companies. Um, what's really interesting in the conversations there is um, how do we help educate our customers on the right supplements to be taking while you're on a GLP-1 medication. Um, GNC is doing a fantastic job with this. They've created a whole section within their store. So they're really trying to take that guesswork out of it for consumers. And they've invested heavily in um, training their staff to really be able to have those conversations with the customers while they're in store. Um, I think really the key here is to stay agile. I know that's a really buzzy word when we're talking innovation, um, but this is emerging, right? We're just on the forefront of it. So products that are coming out today are gonna to be very different than the products coming out down the road. I know Philip's more of the expert in, in foresight, but I just think the possibilities in this space are really endless for innovation. I wanna dial into the, the, the frozen food space because I think mm -hmm. obviously it's, it's, a, it's a very immediate like effect of, yeah. of this is what happens in the food and beverage space. But I think that that's a really interesting to dial, thing to dial in on. Frozen meals, which for a person like myself might not necessarily fill me, all of a sudden are taking on a larger share of the marketplace, especially among these people, because if you're eating less, this package that you can buy at the grocery store and make at home can maybe fill your needs, but with a greater nutrient density. And that's kind of what Nestle is getting at with that product, right? Yeah, it's exactly what they're trying to do. They're higher, much higher protein content, much smaller portion sizes so that you feel fuller and you're not kind of compromising that nutritional value you need to maintain that muscle density. That's very important when you're rapidly losing weight. Yeah, so when, you, when you're out there talking to clients about innovating, a new, creating a new product for this, mm -hmm. um, are, there any, are there any watchwords, any points that you'd like to hit on when you're talking to folks about this stuff? I mean, I really do think it's interesting because uh, some of the stuff we are also talking about is what's the right strategy? right? Should I be doing line extensions? Should I be thinking about developing an entirely new brand? And what's interesting when we're talking about that is there's no really one size fits all answer, right? It really depends on your brand and how you've built that equity within the brand. So the strategy becomes a very interesting um, conversation with clients. What are the risks for us? Um, what are the opportunities? Is this the right brand? Should we be thinking about another brand? So it does get very kind of deep into that kind of strategy space. Yeah. Jackie, you're out there you, you're working in syndicated research on a global level like you do. Um, you have all kinds of data from uh, consumption both uh, in, a, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, are you seeing that? When you take that out to clients, are you talking at all about how they should direct that? Um, well, I, I think it, it's different for every client that we're going to, right? So if we're talking to pharmaceutical clients, they're more interested in really just understanding what, who are the patient types that are taking them, you know, how, which types of doctors are prescribing them, what indications are they being used for, or what comorbidities do the patients have. Um, if if uh, we have other clients that are not in the healthcare industry buying them, they're looking at them for some of the questions that um, both were just talking about. Could be even just about, you know, positioning. 
You know, so how do I position? Who are these consumers that are taking them? You know, I've, all, I've often thought that there's also kind of a risk tolerance, right? So who are the people that are taking a GLP-1 to, wait, to lose weight versus those who will never take one, right? There's got to be some behavioral science in that, right? Thinking about that. Um, so I think that there's different segments of the consumers. And I think that's really interesting because how do you market to them? How do you innovate to them? You know, how do you strategize in order to, to gain the lion's share of uh, market share with those different segments of consumers. And you're selling this data to, I mean, you work in healthcare, but you have said that you're selling this data to, to folks outside of your normal wheelhouse because it is so interesting to all different sectors. Right, because we're, you know, we have studies that are entirely focused on kind of the healthcare side of it, but we also have studies that are focused on the consumption side of it, right? So what's happening, how are how are consumption habits changing in, in different sectors, right? Um, what's the awareness like of consumers? You know, how are they learning about these different um, drugs? How are they getting them? There's different ways to get them, right? We know that there's there's different, you know, you see it advertised if you're sitting in America, you know, and DTC advertising here, different uh, organizations where you can go and get a, a GLP-1 agent or at least a compounded agent. So um, we're, we're diving into all of that to understand, you know, more about the consumers that are that are taking these, these products. Yeah. I love what you said about the even you said before with the stigma, and then you know there's still some people out there who will say, "I will never take one of these." Mm -hmm. And will that actually be true in a yeah. world where a lot of this will will shift, right? And we've seen it with other products along the way, right? Like we go back to the Prozac example, the Viagra yeah. example. Probably, if you go back to the pill, look at how that reshapes society. Yeah. And if you th I guess if you think about this, you know, it, positioning is also really important for the pharmaceutical companies that are manufacturing these drugs, right? Yeah. Because if there is the "I'm not taking that for weight loss," that's the easy way out. But now it's going to be approved in liver diseases. It's going to be approved in, you know, different diseases. Now, what's the stigma? Is there a stigma? To, and how how should the manufacturers of these agents be talking about it? I mean, this is a this is a giant shift in healthcare, right? It's going to change the way you know people are you know being treated and and preventing different diseases, right? So that's a real positive. But the positioning is important, like Absolutely, you said. Yeah. 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 And when we think about innovation, you know, it's really becoming that companion. Yeah, you know, to that journey. So how do I, you know, bring my brand and products along in that journey and become part of their kind of holistic health? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Great. I think it's time uh, we have some questions coming in from the audience, I believe. So let me check and see what we've got coming in here. Uh, Jackie, this kind of jumps off a bit what we were just talking about. Let's throw this to you. So, um, People talk a lot about how this is going to change the world, but right now the price puts it out of reach for many people. How can we address the income issue and democratize access? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think it's beyond price that puts it out of reach. I think up until recently there was a manufacturing issue, right? So two products available with a huge amount of demand and not enough manufacturing to you know to, to fill the, the demand. So that was one of the issues with people um, being able to access the medications. I think price is another one. But as I said earlier, there's almost a hundred different products in, in development, right? When more products come out, price goes down, right? But also the indication for the drugs have changed. So when they were first introduced, it was for obese patients with a BMI of over 30, right? Now that that indication has gotten um, for overweight patients, overweight patients with a cardiovascular, um, it, you know, some sort of cardiovascular uh, effect. So more people are being approved, right, for the drugs. I also think that in time, what we're going to see is when I go back and talk about the, uh, the benefits that these drugs have in different, in different diseases, when you look at the, the cost of treating a patient over their lifespan, right? So if a patient has hypertension, for example, and you can prevent hypertension, right, then you're, you're reducing the amount of treatment that they need. Cardiovascular impacts cost a lot of money, right? So if you're able to prevent cardiovascular, you know, obesity is linked to certain cancer types. If you're able to prevent those cancer types, think about the cost savings for, you know, pretty expensive, you know, anti-cancer drugs. So I think that what's going to happen is we're going to see payers looking at, you know, what is the cost benefit, right? And so then approving the drugs is going to become much easier because in the long run, you're saving money. Plus, from the time that they were introduced, the price point has already come down, right? 
And we've, we've seen that already, right, with yeah. a lot of the um, insurance companies who mm -hmm. will look at somebody who is pre-diabetic and recommend that they speak with a yeah. specialist, they do some intervention. Mm -hmm. This is a logical extension of that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, while we've seen some inequity in who can get these, these drugs, I do believe that that's going to change over time, especially as they're approved for more indications, more products become available. Um, so I think we're going to be able to see much greater access down, down the line. And, you know, from the 10 percent of people that, you know, we've, we've polled that are receiving them now, I can see that number greatly increased in the future. All right, let's, uh, let's take another question here. Um, Philip, I'll throw this one to you. So these changes aren't really happening today, are they? Uh, how much do we really need to worry about this now? So it's interesting. Obviously, uh, I'm a huge fan of foresight and, and the work we do in foresight. And I see it more and more in business questions that we get asked. And when we think about foresight is, is really about how do we prepare for the future? We don't like to say we predict what's going to happen, but we like to prepare for multiple eventualities. And one of the things we'll often do is we'll, we'll prompt to our clients or when we do this work with them on imagine a world where, right, is, a, is the starting phrase. And so imagine a world where there is no such thing as a craving or an addiction. Right? Imagine that's gone, just disappeared. And yet that's very provocative as a statement. But think about, I, I'd argue there's almost zero brands out there that would necessarily want to operate in a world like that the way they operate today. They have to really think about their brand because what do we naturally want to do? We want to sell more. We want to more people. We want to consume more of our product, our services on an ongoing basis. Imagine if people are much, much more choiceful and deliberate about those decisions and they're less beholden to their biology when it comes to making them. It changes brand strategy. It changes what you communicate. It changes what you produce. All of those things have the opportunity to be upended in a world like that. So that's just one example, right? Another one might be imagine a world where um, being slim is no longer a status symbol, right? What does that change about the world around us as well? Does that change? Are there other things that become status symbols among the wealthy and the elite, right? So those types of provocations we like to put out there to our clients because if you're going to prepare for a world like that, you have to start doing it today and work backwards from that eventuality and there's a stepping stone approach to doing that. So, so I do think we should always be looking ahead, right? And to be honest, we actually do it through the rest of our lives on an ongoing basis. You book a vacation, you're doing a little bit of foresight, you're planning ahead what you think might happen, right? When you leave for the airport, where you're gonna stay, all those things. It's no different for businesses as we start to think, of, think ahead and think about the future. With this specifically, have you thought at all about a tipping point or a horizon at, at which each business needs to really consider this? Uh, I'm not saying you should throw down numbers yeah. right now, but I mean, certainly there is, um, there is a point at which each business, uh, each different type of business, each sector needs to consider where, okay, if food and beverage clients are affected immediately, how much further down the line does that affect airlines? How much further down the line does that affect retail, et cetera, et cetera? You know, it's interesting because I, I don't know that there's direct tipping points that happen like this. And we see this a lot in, in the world. We always look for these tipping points, but often you look around, you wake up one day, you look around and suddenly the world is very, very different, right? Like, I don't think how many of us noticed when we shifted from a world where we had something called social networking sites and now they're just called social media because the dynamic about them changed. I wouldn't call there a specific tipping point in that. There's just something that starts to change around us. So my sense is it's always, or, or advice is, it's never too late to start planning now for the future because you need to be prepared for suddenly that world will be different and you won't even, you won't even recognize it. <laughs> Let's take another question here. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw this one to you, Allison, since you haven't had one yet. So, uh, people have been trying to change their habits forever. Why do brands need to create totally new products for this now? Oh, that is a that's a great question because, you know, habits are strong, right? Um, I think there's research out there that says it's what takes 14 days, you know, to to change a change a habit, myself included. We make New Year's resolutions, right? I think all of us have been there. Um, but I think what's important about this is this isn't a fad, right? This is this is really here to stay. Um, and brands that act now are going to have that competitive advantage. So if you're kind of sitting back and waiting to see where the space is going, you're going to be too late um, to, to enter the space. And those brands, I think that make this 
support people in that lifestyle change and make this a more holistic kind of approach to health and wellness are really going to be the ones that kind of succeed in this new world that we're, we're shifting to. Yeah, I, that's a good point. I mean, and there are so many different kinds of companies that are already operating in spaces where they don't have to create something totally new, right? hundred like percent. Like you talked about supplements before. Mm -hmm. right? It's as, just yeah. making it easier for people or as uh, Jackie was saying earlier, adjusting messaging, right? If we look at beauty brands, there's already plenty of like firming serums and all this stuff out there today, right? So it's like, how do we adjust that message, right? To cater to this audience that will need products like that because as they're losing weight, it has impact on their, you know, skin health and the elasticity of their skin. So I think there's lots of, of ways that you can just do subtle tweaks to what you're doing today. Um, while the bigger innovation, you know, kind of works through the system, um, like personalization, I think is going to be so important in this space because everyone's body is different in how they react to this. So everyone's going to need something a little different. So if we have a cookie cutter approach to this, it's just not going to be, you know, successful. And that goes back to the segmentation. I really think, you know, there are consumers that are using GLP-1s and their goal is I'm going to jumpstart my weight loss. I'm going to start a new healthier, you know, um, approach. I'm going to increase my exercise. Um, you know, that's one segment. There could be another segment who's like, I'm going to just lose some weight. I'm probably going to eat the same pizza I was eating yesterday, but instead of two pieces, I'm going to eat one, right? Um, there are people that are using them more for the medical, you know, side of it, the cardiovascular impact, um, you know, or down the line, we'll be using it for other comorbidities they have. So I think understanding what's driving each of those segments and how, again, to market to them. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of brands that were actually really well placed before this even happened. And, you know, you've heard people talk about Ozempic face. It's not, it's not about Ozempic. It's about weight loss and skin sagging. And all of those companies who have the skin tightening creams, they were in great position already. There's also clothing lines that are adjustable, right? Yeah. The, true the True Fit yeah. jeans from the, you know, Khloe Kardashian um, line. I mean, they were out a long time ago, and yet they're perfectly positioned for this segment of, of consumers. Yeah. So. Or, or even adjacent products, right? Like I, I think I, I see a potential for if you have, I don't know how many of you know this Caravan, those uh, products, yeah, right? It's yeah. like preserves your wine. Mm -hmm. You know, traditionally it's marketed as if you got a nice expensive bottle, you want to be able to drink it over a longer period of time and not mm -hmm. spoil after you open it. It allows you to open the wine and drink, drink it without having to uncork it, right? Um, imagine that for somebody who is cutting down on alcohol because they're just not feeling the need to drink as much of it, right? And so suddenly this product has a new message. It's in an ancillary uh, case, but I think it, those types of things we're gonna see emerge, I reckon. Yeah, we're also seeing lots of mergers and acquisitions, right? So Mars just uh, purchased this past summer, Kevin's Natural Products, which is already a you know healthy you know meal uh, out there for people. So I, I think there's lots of interesting things yeah. that are gonna start to emerge. Yeah. And I think that's the most interesting thing about the GLP ones is that every single consumer is different. They have different needs. Some people, you know, we talk to people all the time. Some people have had no changes in their consumption of alcohol while others can't. Uh, some people have had certain foods that they can no longer eat that used to be their absolute favorite and they can't have it anymore, um, just don't want it anymore. So I, I, I think it's really interesting to understand the dynamics of each of the different, you know, people that are taking them. Yeah. I think you're right. It's, it's almost like I, 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 find I almost think of the analogy in my head of like tradition you might take or what some people have talked about with G these GLP ones is you take a pebble, you can skip it across a, a lake and it's going to go in a straight line and people are looking at that's what the effect's going to be. It's going to do this and then this and then this. But in reality, it's more you throw it up, it lands and there's a ripple effect mm -hmm. through the whole lake. And I think that's probably more likely what we're going to see here. All right, here's, here's another opportunity to kind of jump off all the different areas that we've tapped on here. Um, I mean, we've talked about a lot of different sectors here, but is there something that's totally different that's, that's going on, like other unforeseen sectors or just broad things that this is going to affect that we haven't talked about yet? I, I think absolutely. I think that there's probably no sector that won't, that, that won't be affected in some way. I think we've seen differences in spending habits of consumers that are taking GLP ones. We've seen money being spent differently for, for uh, gyms and health and fitness, but also for vacations. And that kind of 
dives a little bit deeper into the question about what about vacations? Yeah, well, because spending is the ultimate impulse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So will people be going on the same type of vacations they did before? Will they be going to all-inclusive? If they have less desire to eat, will they be going to all-inclusive resorts if they're not drinking or eating as much? Will they change where they're going, what they're doing? I mean, those are a couple of the, the segments that I think that'll be impacted, and I'm yeah. sure that there's there's well, even more. Will you see more adventure-type travel? Will you see, or in the all-inclusive resorts, are they going to start to save money as well in terms of what they offer and they put out there. So I think there's, you're right, there's a lot of different ways that could play out. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I think, you know, we also talked a little bit, I know we were talking about the, the clothing industry earlier and, you know, not just in terms of innovation, in terms of new products, but what about um, companies like Rent the Runway, yeah. right? Where you're renting different clothing because you're going to be going down in different sizes, right? So you know, how will, how will businesses innovate to, to go after the, you know, this kind of changing demographic, right? Or how do you even see how fashion evolves, right? Beyond just yeah. TrueFit, are there other things like side tabs we're already seeing in, in trousers and yeah. pants? Is that going to make another emergence here? Those types of things that we might see. Yeah. And even things around inventory management, yeah. right? Like if people are losing weight, how does that, you know, impact the sizes, you know, and how much of each you know, these retailers are carrying. So lots of impacts, I think, in the fashion sector. Even in the even in the shopping sector, like, so if you're walking into a store, I think you were talking about this before, you said GNC has a whole a whole section, right? That's, so where, where do you put your products, right? When you're walking into a store, right? Like, so you normally have that health aisle somewhere, you know, is that gonna be positioned a little bit differently in the stores, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's so many different sectors that are gonna be, you know, um, impacted by this and I like I said I I'm really hard pressed to think about one business that uh, one sector one business one company that wouldn't have interest in this yeah insurance right yeah absolutely insurance. Yeah. I mean we, we kind of skipped over uh, and and as we spun out into all other sectors but I mean just on the healthcare sector itself this is going to have a huge impact right like we, we went past that but I mean in terms of uh, insurance or how much the government spends on health care. Um, what are they? What are the outflows? What are the results for pharmacies? Uh, it, it's huge in healthcare. I mean, I said this before. This is a healthcare revolution. You know, so, you know. Uh, People are talking about AI, and AI is, you know, incredibly, you know, it's, it's a revolution as well. But in healthcare, I think the GLP ones are a bigger revolution than than AI. I mean, that's my personal opinion. But it's because these drugs have the ability to go across so many different indications and be beneficial to so many different patients, and that you know, that will help impact health equity, right? People, there'll be more doctors available to treat the people that really need to be treated because you're going to be preventing so many other diseases, right? Right now, there's a real burden on the healthcare system. There's not enough doctors to go around to treat all of the people that need to be treated. If you could reduce some of the the diseases, prevent some of the diseases, that actually helps with health equity. I mean, it goes back to your question earlier about, you know, cost playing a role. And so cost plays a role right now in people not getting them, but down the line, I can actually see improved, you know, access. Yeah. Right. Well, what does that even mean? Knock on effects, right? Longer lifespans. How does yeah. that mean for our economy? Retirement yeah. ages. Does that change? I yeah. don't know. Well, and that could, that's right. That's the knock on, right? So if people are living longer and there's, there's some evidence that, you know, if you, if you cut down all these comorbidities, you know, people will live longer well into their nineties. So then that, that leads to the next question is how do you prepare for people that are li living a longer lifestyle, yeah. a longer life, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think that the, you know, the implications of, of this class of drug, you know, they, they just can't be understated, right? It's huge implications across the board. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap it here. So thank you all so much for joining us today. I got to say, I think we'll be back again to talk about this at some point in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. If you haven't yet, I highly recommend diving into the full report on Ipsos.com to learn so much more about GLP-1 drugs and how they could reshape society. We're taking a break from the Insights to Activate series for the holidays, but we'll be back again in January with a look into cutting-edge, practical ways you and your company can use artificial intelligence. Thanks again for watching. I'm Ben Meyerson, and this has been Insights to Activate with Ipsos.